Hey, everybody. So today we're going to be going over OCAM fundamentals. We're going to be focusing on what I like to call our OCAM toolkit. And so topics covered in this video are going to include degrees of unsaturation, inductive effect and resonance, carbocation and carbanion stability, um, nucleophilicity, electrophilicity, leaving group ability, as well as ring strain, common organic chem, PKAs, stereoisomerism, including um, chirality and antimers diastereomers, of course, as well as meso compounds. We'll do constitutional conformational isomers, geometric isomers, and absolute configuration. So degrees of unsaturation. So what does it mean to be saturated or what does it mean to be unsaturated? Any thoughts, any ideas? So saturate, go ahead. Unsaturations with double bonds and then saturations, no double bonds. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So saturation refers to bonding with hydrogen. So a saturated compound will have all possible bonds to hydrogen are, are made. And what is, a, what is a degree of unsaturation? It's when two atoms are bonding to each other when they could be bonding to hydrogen instead. So saturation, refers to bonds with hydrogen. A saturated compound will have no either pi bonds as well as no rings. Because remember a ring is when we have two atoms as well bonded to each other instead of hydrogen. So an unsaturated compound will have, of course, either pi bonds, one or more, pi bonds or rings. So for instance, if we were to take a molecule like this and react with H2 and palladium using a carbon catalyst, or H2 using a palladium carbon catalyst. So is this guy saturated or unsaturated? Um, unsaturated. Yeah, so we're starting with an unsaturated compound and we're doing what's called a hydrogenation reaction. Oh, nice, I saw those in the chat now. So we go boom, boom, boom. And now we go from an unsaturated to a saturated. And which one is more oxidized? Which one is more reduced? Saturated is more reduced. Saturated is more reduced. Unsaturated is more oxidized. And then if we try to react this guy with H2 palladium carbon, would anything happen? Or we get no reaction? We get no reaction, good. 
question. Which hydrocarbon would yield most energy during catabolism? We have A, C16, H30. We have B, C16, H32, and we have C, C16, H34. Which would yield the most energy upon catabolism? So I see a few A's in the chat. Which compound is the most oxidized? Which compound is the most reduced? Which one's the most reduced here? Um, C. C is the most reduced, right? Is catabolism oxidative or reductive? Thinking about like glucose catabolism. So we've done a few weeks of metabolism together. Glucose gets um, metabolized during full aerobic respiration all the way to what molecule? Yeah, catabolism oxidative. Is it O2 or CO2? Um, CO2. So CO2, right? So if our third one, C16H34, has the most bonds to hydrogen, that means it's the most reduced and it has the most potential, right, for oxidation to happen. So our molecule C would yield the most energy upon complete catabolism. Does that make sense? In other words, if A is already the most oxidized, it has the least, like, uh, I don't want to say potential, potential is a loaded word. Um, it has the most, uh, uh, if it's the most oxidized, it has the least ability to be completely like further oxidized. And so therefore it has the least amount of electrons. We can extract the least amount of electrons from it, right? And therefore, if we were to send something like this through complete metabolism, and by the way, humans wouldn't be able to do this. We don't digest hydrocarbons, uh, but you can get bacteria that can do so. Uh, they would be able to extract the most electrons out of this compound because this one being more oxidized has already lost some. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, moving on. So we have a formula, four degrees of unsaturation. And, and this is the same thing, degrees of unsaturation is the same thing as, you might hear double bond equivalence, DBEs. And so similarly, double bond equivalence is either a double bond or it's a ring. The formula for this is two times the number of carbons plus two plus the number of nitrogens minus the number of halogens and hydrogens all over two. So for example, if we were to have a molecule that looks like, well, that the formula is C7H9NO and looks like the following. How many degrees of unsaturation would there be? Zero, three, four, or five. So we can plug into our equation 
we can say two times the number of carbons, which should be two times seven plus the two that's always there, plus one for the nitrogen, minus nine hydrogens, we have no halogens, all over two. Now let's see, I saw in the chat, I saw three. So are you looking at four? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we could do this two ways, right? If you're given a structure and a formula, it's probably better to use the structure because the molecular formula would require you to just plug into this equation. And who has time for that on the MCAT, right? So we could count one pi bond, two pi bonds, three pi bonds, as well as one ring for a total of four. Or we could say 14 plus two plus one minus nine over two should be 16, 17 minus nine, 17 minus nine is eight over two, which gives us four. Just making sure that our formula works. Any questions on the degrees of insaturation formula or on this example? Okay, unless anybody objects, we're gonna move on to induction. So there are two types of electronic effects. We call them on the MCAT. There's induction and resonance. So two types of electronic effects, induction and resonance. Induction is going to be the movement of electron density through sigma bonds. The movement of electron density through sigma bonds. Both types of electronic effects can stabilize or destabilize a molecule. depending on what else is going on in the molecule. And induction is gonna be an important property for a lot of different things, for acidity and basicity, reactivity, What's the relationship between stability and reactivity? Does stability and reactivity uh, have a direct relationship or an inverse relationship? An inverse, right? More stable, less reactive. So the more stable a molecule is, the happier it is in the current state, right? So it doesn't want to react. Um, we could also talk about free energy, right? So if you have a lot of free energy, are you more stable or more reactive? Yeah, if you have more free energy, you're more reactive and you're less stable. So we'll see with reactions, reactions are gonna to move towards having less free energy and becoming more stability, having more stability. And so we can talk about things like Delta G when it comes to that. So for an example, of induction, let's rank the acidity of the following. We'll call this molecule one, or no, A. I'm about to rank these things. Okay, so we have four different carboxylic acids. And so which one of these would be the most acidic? 
And while you're answering that, I'm gonna be right back, get another fresh marker. So which one of these would be the most acidic? A, B, C, or D? Looking at B. So let's see. When we talk about acidity, D. When you talk about acidity, what we really want to think about is how willing is a molecule to give up a proton? Right? The more willing a molecule is to give up a proton, we could say the more acidic it is. And therefore, we have to consider not only the acid, but also its conjugate base. So let's turn all four of these into conjugate bases. So when you lose a proton, you lose an H and a plus, and our carboxylic acids will all become carboxylates. So people who liked D as the most acidic, why would we have D be the most acidic? Of the most stable or the least stable conjugate base? Florian is electron withdrawing. Good. Yeah, most stable conjugate base. Perfect. So for a problem like this, we're thinking about induction in terms of electron withdrawing groups. And electron withdrawing groups will be highly electronegative elements. And so we could definitely say that fluorine being super electronegative is gonna be able to inductively withdraw a lot of electron density from this minus, delocalizing the minus charge more across the entire molecule and therefore helping to stabilize this unstable formal charge. So I agree. Let's put this one as number one most acidic. And who would be, who would be the next? Next one would be C. So between C and B, we have two chlorines, right? And so why is C better than B? They're both the same electronegativity, right? C can undergo induction. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that both can undergo induction, but which one's better? The closer or the further? C is closer. Yeah, it's closer, right? So the other part of induction will also include proximity. So because the chlorine here is closer, then we could say, it's better at withdrawing electron density. And this guy's gonna have a weaker ability to withdraw electron density because this chlorine is further away. And that leaves our just carboxylic acid, uh, propanoic acid as number four here. Excuse me, so any questions? Really straightforward. Okay, so this is going to be our definition of electron withdrawing groups in induction. Now let's talk about electron donating groups in induction. Electron donating groups. So for example, Let's use the carbocation stability. And let's rank our carbocations Which would be our most stable carbocation? A, B, C, or D? 
would be D, right? So what's the rule with carbocations? The more what they are, the more stable. The more what a carbocation is, the more substituted the carbocation is, the more stable it is. Perfect. So we'll have D followed by, and so D would be what degree of substitution of the carbocation? Primary, secondary, tertiary? Nice, yeah, it has more electron donating groups, tertiary. So our tertiary carbocation will be better than our secondary carbocation, be better than our primary. And then lastly, we call this guy just a methyl carbocation. And these guys really, really unstable, they're the worst. So why are, Our groups, why are our groups electron donating for induction? So we think about what's happening here. Now let's draw in our methyl. Anybody have any good mnemonics for electronegativity? that you've heard of. Good mnemonics for electronegativity. Do we all know Fonkelbrisch? So Fonkelbrisch is your go-to mnemonic when it comes to electronegativity, where we have from most electronegative to least electronegative. Fonkelbrisch, everybody, everybody at home say Fonkelbrisch. Fonkelbrisch. So you wanna remember, it's kind of like, it's like a German last name, it's got the S-C-H. So you wanna forget about carbon actually coming before hydrogen here. So when carbon is making a bond to hydrogen, and we went over this in the oxidation numbers video as well, when carbon's making a bond to hydrogen, carbon's actually slightly more electronegative. Now it's not a huge difference, but it means that a carbon bonded to a lot of hydrogens is gonna be more electron dense. And so that will actually allow our groups to share some electron density with positive regions or technically with anybody, but it would be most helpful for them to share some electron density with a positive group and help to minimize the degree of positive charge or delocalize it. Okay. So we have in electron donating groups uh, in induction, any questions? All right, so then let's do one more induction example. Try to combine both of these. The question is, which of the following would yield the highest KEQ upon deprotonation by tert butyl lithium. So the following would yield the greatest KEQ upon deprotonation by tert butyl lithium. And the hydrogen being deprotonated, I'm going to circle.
which of the following would yield the highest KEQ upon deep retination by turf butyl lithium? And so what is this question really asking us? It's asking us which molecule is the most what? That will be stable. The most stable after it loses a proton, right? Yeah. In other words, this is another acidity question. And what do we call a deprotonated carbon? Yeah, it's gonna be carbanion, right? So this is gonna be for carbanion stability. So are these guys gonna follow the same rules as carbocations or not? Gonna follow the opposite. Do we want electron donating groups here? Or do we want electron withdrawing groups here? Could you take that question again, sorry? Yeah, so what would, what would best stabilize a carbanion? Electron donating groups or electron withdrawing groups? Donating, I think. Donating. So if we have a negative charge and we are donating more electrons to it, are we helping delocalize it? Or are we actually making the problem worse? Oh, worse. <laughs> yeah, we're actually making the problem worse. So we do want to have withdrawing groups, yes. Good, so then which one of these is gonna be the most effective at withdrawing? D. D, right? So our D is gonna have three chlorines right next door, be able to delocalize a lot of that negative charge via the inductive effect. And then who's probably the next best? B. B. So B at least has one chlorine, one, number two, and then between A and C, who's the next best? C. C. So which one between A and C has more R groups? C has more R groups. So is that helping stabilize or destabilize the negative charge? Stabilize. Stabilize. Remember, if these R groups are, are they donating or withdrawing? Yeah, they're, de they're donating, they're destabilizing. So this guy, these guys are trying to push more electron density towards the negative charge. And so they are destabilizing it. So actually, conversely to carbocations, methyl, carbanion would be more stable than a secondary carbanion. So the way it works with carbanions is the opposite. So the most stable carbanion is methyl, followed by primary, followed by secondary, followed by tertiary would be the least stable. And then of course, if we have some chlorines in here that are doing withdrawing, then those will actually help a lot. Okay. Any questions on carbanions? I'm sorry, is it okay if you could go over that again between the carbanion, carbanion and carbocation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when it comes to carbocations, we have a loss of electron density. We have a incomplete octet. So carbocations are highly unstable because they have a not only a formal charge, they also have a incomplete octet. 
And so they're highly electron deficient. So with carbocations, it's better to have electron donating groups, AKA R groups, which makes tertiary carbocations better than secondary, better than primary, better than methyl. So it flipped it around when it comes to carbon ions. Carbon ions, their problem is they have too much negative charge. They have a carbon who has a lone pair. So carbon ions are gonna like to have electron withdrawing groups so that they can pull as much electron density away from the negative charge. Or if we have R groups on our carbocations, it's better to have as few R groups as possible because R groups are gonna serve to donate electron density but if we have a carbocation or carbanion, we already have too much electron density. So then the most stable carbanion would be methyl, followed, sorry, yeah, followed by primary, followed by secondary. And then tertiary with three electron donating groups would be the worst. That makes sense. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm, of course. All right. So we covered the first electronic effect induction, and we snuck in some carbocation, carbanion stuff for our toolkit here. And now let's go over resonance. And this won't be the last we see of resonance, but we're just kind of trying to cover, we're not doing like full on resonance structures at this point, we'll do that a little later. Um, but we are gonna cover resonance as an as a electronic effect. And so with resonance, we have pi bonds, we have carbocations, and we have lone pairs. And all of these can act through resonance. So when it comes to electron withdrawing groups and electron donating groups, We could use, for instance, the example. Oh, excuse my waiter. We could use, for instance, the example of a carboxylate. So, in a carboxylate, uh, lone pairs, LPs, lone pairs. Mm -hmm. Nice. So, in a carboxylate. We know it has a resonance structure, right? That's what makes a carboxylic acid, for instance, a better acid than like an alcohol, right? So how's the resonance structure gonna go? How are we gonna push the electrons? We push the electrons away from who and towards whom? Away from the... Oxygen will always wanna grab electrons to itself, right? It does, but it doesn't like having a formal charge. So we know oxygen's electronegative, but nobody actually likes having formal charge. So we can push electrons from this oxygen, from the more electron dense region towards this oxygen, towards the less electron dense region. And then we would get this guy. So who acted as an electron donating group out of these three from this example? And who acted as an electron withdrawing group? So the electron donating group, was it pi bonds, carbocations, or lone pairs? The donating group was lone pairs, good. So lone pairs will serve as electron donating groups. And who served as the electron withdrawing group? The pi bonds. And then we could use a different example for carbocations, although you might be already thinking which property they're going to have. We have a, let's see, carbonyl minor resonance structure. We know that we could push electrons away from the O minus towards that carbocation. 
Remember, we use double-sided arrows when it comes to resonance structures. And so carbocation acted as a donating group or a withdrawing group. Withdrawing, good. So here's our summary table of the electronic effects of induction. Oh, sorry, resonance. Of oh, resonance. Any questions here? All right, let's move on. Now let's talk about nucleophilicity. Oh yeah, so electron withdrawing groups and electron donating groups, you think of as one of the three rather than as the atoms. Yeah, so one way to think about in like resonance, so we had pi bonds, we had lone pairs and we had carbocations. All three of those can participate in conjugated systems that can potentially resonate. So when it comes to um, these with resonance, we can think about like electron density. So, a lone pair versus a pi bond. Which one is more electron dense? A lone pair or a pi bond? Yeah, a lone pair is gonna be more electron dense. So think about a lone pair as being like just on one atom, not being shared, right? Pi bonds on the other hand, pi bonds are being shared so they're gonna be less electron dense. And who's the least electron dense? Cations, right? Carbocations. So carbocations are gonna be the least electron dense because they're not even sharing electrons. They're just electron deficient, right, in general. So that could be one way to like approach thinking about um, inductive and re resonant donation and withdrawal. Does that answer your question? Awesome. So let's talk about uh, nucleophilicity. And we'll start by bringing back some definitions of Lewis acids and bases. So Lewis acids and bases, as opposed to the Bronsted-Lowry definition where we talk about proton donation, <clears throat> excuse me, proton um, acceptors. With the Lewis definition, we're thinking about electrons. So a Lewis acid is an electron donor or electron acceptor? Electron acceptor. A Lewis base is an electron. Donor. Excellent. So when we now can compare that to nucleophiles. So if we break down nucleophile, we can think of, we know phile is love and nucleo, can you think about like a nucleus? What is the charge of a nucleus? Positive, negative, neutral? Positive, right? So a nucleophile is somebody who loves positive charge, positive loving. So are nucleophiles electron dense or electron poor? Electron dense. And specifically to be a nucleophile, you have to be electron dense atom with a lone pair electron dense atom with a lone pair. There will be three uh, main determiners of nucleophilicity. The first will be formal charge. So if we compare 
O2 minus and Cl minus, which one is going to be the better nucleophile? O2 minus, good. So nucleophilicity will increase with increasing negative formal charge. That one's probably the most intuitive. It's got more negative formal charge. You want to do something with it. You want to give it to somebody who's maybe electron poor. Then second. We can talk about increasing size. So with I minus versus F minus, iodide versus fluoride. Which one is the better nucleophile? Is the large one or the small one? Mm. Yeah, this is a little puzzling because it seems more intuitive that the small one would be the more nucleophilic, but nucleophilicity will actually increase with size. And so one thing we wanna talk about while we're here, yeah, the larger one, one thing we wanna talk about while we're here is polarizability. So, what's the difference between polarizability and polarity? What's polarity? Is that when electrons? Polarity, I think, has to do with uh, my ability to dissolve in water, I think. Uh, it results in ability to dissolve in water. Yep. Mm -hmm. So more polar molecules are going to, water's very polar. We know like dissolves like, right? The difference in electronegativity between the atoms bonded. Good. So polarity deals with unequal distribution or unequal sharing of electrons. And that is determined by differences in electronegativity between atoms who are bonded. And so we can have polar bonds, we can have nonpolar bonds, nonpolar bonds where the ele electrons are being equally shared, polar bonds where the electrons are being unequally shared. We can even extrapolate and say that some molecules are more polar, other molecules are more nonpolar. You're a more polar molecule if you have more polar bonds that are not being canceled out by geometry. Or a more nonpolar molecule, if your if your polar bonds are being canceled out in geometry by like, for instance, CO2, carbon dioxide has a 180 degree two polar bonds, so they cancel each other out and overall it's nonpolar. Or you could just be an, a, a molecule who has no polar bonds. Um, we could kind of say like methane, for instance, even though as we saw a moment ago, carbon slightly more electronegative than hydrogen. We could say diatomic oxygen, O2, is nonpolar. So that's polarity. So as opposed to polarizability, anybody have a good definition of polarizability? Rotation, oh, okay. So you're thinking about um, rotation of plane polarized light. So that would be for chirality. We'll talk about that a little later today. So polarizability is the ability of an atom or a molecule to temporarily shift electron density. And so polarizability will have to do with how tightly the electrons are being held to an atom. So if you're a small element like fluorine, are you holding onto your electrons very tightly or not very tightly? Very tightly. Yeah, so the smaller the element is, the more tight, and that, that's the definition of size, right? How far away are the electrons from the nucleus? If you're, a lot, if you're a small element, your electrons are being tightly held to the nucleus. And so you're not very polarizable. You're not gonna be able to shift those electrons in one way or another, because there's just not a lot of space to shift them. Because if you're a very large boy like iodine, iodine, is it holding its electrons tightly or loosely? very loosely, otherwise it wouldn't be so large, right? So with iodine, think about, iodine versus fluorine, these both have a negative charge. 
iodine will be able to temporarily move some electron density. So for instance, if iodine is near an alkyl halide, like methyl bromide, what we know is a polar bond between carbon and bromine, when iodine comes up nearby this partial positive carbon, it's going to shift some of its electron density towards the partial positive carbon. And so iodine is going to polarize itself. It's also going to polarize the, meth the alkyl halide as well by pushing, because its electrons are getting close to the carbon, it's also going to push more electrons towards the bromine away from the partial positive carbon. So not only is iodine going to polarize itself, it's also going to polarize the molecule it's trying to attack. So with increasing size, we have increasing polarizability. With increasing polarizability, we have greater ability to form temporary dipoles that can be used to make an nucleophilic attack. Any questions on that one? So the answer is I. Yep. I know this. Good. Yeah. Um, polarizability, I feel like, is a little bit of a neglected topic um, because it does help explain a, a, a lot of different things. It just helps us explain the size effect of nucleophilicity. It can help us explain leaving group ability, as we'll see in like five minutes. It can help us explain things like London dispersion forces, right? You know, the larger a molecule is, the better London dispersion forces. What's that? How do we define a London dispersion force? I think it's the weakest of all the forces. Um... Mm -hmm. And so a London dispersion force, electron distribution, good. So with LDFs, London dispersion forces, it's the ability to make temporary dipoles. And every element has somewhat of an ability. But now we have this idea called polarizability, which can help us explain why, for instance, we think about iodine, um, I2 solid, iodine solid is very large. And so if we, yeah, it's a little bit of a side tangent, not really actually, I mean, this is all relevant. We think about, for instance, um, the states of matter on the periodic table, so if you remember ever seeing a color-coded periodic table, they use blue for gases, red for liquids, and black for solids. Anybody remember seeing something like that? Because iodine is a solid at room temperature. It is, right? But all of these compounds, first of all, they're all diatomic, right? They're all diatomic in their standard state. Are they polar, nonpolar? They're all nonpolar, right? Good. So the only intermolecular force that they have is what? LDS, right? So then we can't use something like polarity or electronegativity to determine why um, or to help explain this relationship. But what we can use is size. So we know as we go on the periodic table down and to the left, we have increasing size. So Br2 is going to be larger than Cl2. And so we're going in increasing London dispersion forces. Chlorine has better London dispersion forces than fluorine because chlorine is larger, so it's more polarizable. But bromine is a liquid at room temperature, right? So bromine has even stronger London dispersion forces. And then iodine, being the largest and the most polarizable, therefore, will have the strongest London dispersion forces. 
And that's why we can see, for instance, iodine be a solid at room temp. Any questions on size, polarizability, London dispersion forces? Cool, cool. And then our last factor determining nucleophilicity will be electronegativity. So if we think about NH2 minus versus OH minus hydroxide, which one of those two will be a better nucleophile? NH2 minus or OH minus? OH minus, because it's more More electronegative. So if you're more electronegative, do you want to share your electrons more or less? More. You're you're very generous with your electrons if you're electronegative, you're you're willing to share them. No, you want to take more actually. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we know oxygen's more electronegative. So oxygen actually wants to share its electrons less than NH2 minus. And so the more electronegative you are, the less you want to share your electrons and therefore the less nucleophilic you will be with increasing electronegativity. Questions there? All right, so those are our three factors for determining nucleophilicity. And now we're gonna move on to electrophilicity. So you said nucleophiles were Lewis bases, Electrophiles will be Lewis. What? So electrophiles, we could say, are loving what charge? Loving negative charge, right? So they're minus loving. And so our electron electrophiles, are they electron dense or electron poor? They should be poor since they want more. And so will they be Lewis bases or Lewis acids? And so they'll be Lewis acids, they'll be electron acceptors because they're electron poor, they really want electrons. And fortunately, there's only one real factor when it comes to electrophilicity. There aren't three factors like there are with nucleophilicity. And that would be with increasing positive formal charge or partial positive charge. So if we were to compare, for instance, a carbonyl versus a carbocation. First of all, is the carbonyl bond polar or nonpolar? Carbonyl bond polar or nonpolar? Should be nonpolar because of the presence of the pi bond. So the pi bond is not gonna actually um, affect necessarily the polarity. It's more the difference in electronegativity, right? So we know because oxygen is more electronegative, then we're gonna have a partial positive carbon, right? And so which one of these, the carbonyl carbon or the carbocation is gonna be the better electrophile? Carbonyl carbon or carbocation, better electrophile? Well, the... So is it is a partial positive charge or a full positive charge better for electrophilicity? Who wants the electrons more? Partial or full positive charge? Yeah, the full positive charge, the carbocation. And so there's actually two reasons here going on. So we know that a positive charge 
will be more electrophilic. And also remember carbocations are also extremely unstable because they have an incomplete octet. So that's why, for instance, in like SN1 reactions, when we use a weak, and we'll talk about this in the reaction, which is three, which is lecture three. Um, in SN1, for instance, where we're using a weak nucleophile, as opposed to SN2, where we use a strong one. In SN1, where we use a weak nucleophile, the nucleophile has to wait until a carbocation forms because it's so weak, it can't really attack a partial positive. It waits until there's a full positive carbocation and then it attacks. It's weak, it's weak, but it's strong enough to at least go for a carbocation, which is a strong electrophile. Any questions on electrophilicity before we move on to backtrack? Um, oh, NH2 minus was the better nucleophile because nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen. And therefore nitrogen is more willing to share its electrons, yeah. I, I might have forgotten to put the check there. Okay, let's talk about leaving group ability. So what defines a good, what defines a poor leaving group? So good leaving groups, higher leaving group ability, what kind, of, uh, what kind of charge do leaving groups have once they have left? Positive, negative? What kind of charge do leaving groups have? They have a negative charge, right? So leaving group ability, leaving groups need to be able to stabilize a minus charge. You can see again why we've been talking about all these electronic effects, for instance. And you know what also has to be able to stabilize a, car, a negative charge? A conjugate base. So to compare leaving groups such as I minus, Br minus, Cl minus, or F minus. To compare leaving groups, we can talk about the stability of the conjugate base, and we can also talk about the strength of their conjugate acids. And does anybody remember which of these acids is the strongest? Is it HI, HCl, HBr, HF? HCl, HF is the strongest. So it's actually HI and it actually decreases going to the right here. Is HF a strong acid or is it a weak acid? Yeah, remember HF is actually gonna be a weak acid. Um, it's not gonna be one of our six strong acids. And we've talked a lot about um, stabilizing charge today. So we can think about how willing each of these are to lose a proton in terms of a few different factors, but let's focus on size and polarizability. So I minus we said is huge, Br smaller, Cl even smaller, F is the smallest. So if all of these have a negative charge, Who's the best at delocalizing the negative charge? I, B, R, C, L, or F? Who's the best at delocalizing the negative charge? 
yeah, I is going to be. So because, and this goes back to polarizability, right? If you are an iodine and you have a negative charge, you don't really care. Iodine's like, that's fine. I have a lot of space. I'm not holding onto my electrons very tightly. So I can move some of my electrons around and then evenly distribute that negative charge. Whereas if you're somebody like fluorine, you're kind of, you're in a bad place. You're not gonna be able to move your electrons around to stabilize that negative charge. Um, I don't know, in the past, I've compared it to like a dent on a bike versus a dent on a jumbo jet. Which one's more noticeable? Probably a dent on a bike is more noticeable than a dent on a jumbo jet. I mean, I, I wouldn't want my jumbo jet to have a dent on it, but for the purposes of like, which one is like more noticeable, um, iodine is going to be able to shift its electrons more. And so that's going to make I minus the most stable when it's lost a proton. So we can say the more stable the conjugate base, the more happy it is or content it is to have a minus charge. And so fluorine over here is not content to have a minus charge. And so HF is a weak acid. And F minus is a poor leaving group. I minus is a fantastic leaving group. And Br minus and Cl minus, they're all pretty good leaving groups as well. Any questions here? So to summarize, we could say the greater the strength of the conjugate acid, or the higher the Ka, or the lower the pKa, then the more stable the conjugate base, and the better it is as acting at acting as a leaving group. And then we can actually encourage leaving groups to leave by doing what to them? For instance, if we had a OH, so OH is a poor leaving group. How do we enhance the leaving group ability of a, of a hydroxyl and alcohol? Protonation, right? So if we think about the conjugate acid of OH, the conjugate acid of OH minus is just water. Is water a strong acid? Water is a weak acid. It has a pKa of around 14 or 15. But if we protonate the OH, then now the conjugate acid would be H3O plus. And is that a strong acid? Yeah, H3O plus is like the definition of strong acid, right? So we're using conjugate acids to compare leaving group ability and protonation can serve to increase leaving group ability. In other words, when we protonate something, we're giving it a positive charge. And so when it leaves, it's gonna have less of a negative charge. Okay, so at this point, we can talk about ring strain. This is a little bit of a minor topic. So what is ring strain? when due to the presence 
of a ring, atoms are forced into unfavorable bonding angles. So if we compare That's a really bad equilateral triangle. We can play cyclopropane versus uh, cyclobutane. First of all, what are the hybridizations? What are the hybridizations of these carbons? The S SP, SP2, SP3. SP3, yeah. So none of these are making pi bonds. None of these are carbocations. So they each all have four bonds to four sigma bonds. And remember with hybridization, we count the number of sigma bonds and lone pairs. And so for this carbon right here, for instance, is making one, two, three, four sigma bonds. So we count S, P, 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 or in other words, S, P, three. So all the carbons here are all S, P, three. What does that make their bonding angles? What bonding angles do sp3 atoms like to make? 109.5, excellent. So these guys all prefer 109.5 degree bonding angles. Whereas what are the bonding angles in, what are the bonding angles in cyclobutane? They're all hybridized sp3, but what are the bonding angles like forced to be in that ring? In other words, we have a square, right? So 90. What are the, uh, what are the angles of a triangle add up to? 180. So each bond, each angle in the triangle would be 60. So who has more ring strain, triangle or square? Yeah, cyclopropane, the triangle is going to have more ring strain. Okay. Any questions here on ring strain? Pretty much it. All right, let's talk about common PKAs of organic functional groups. And these are all values to memorize. All right, so the first we'll go over is going to be. the C terminus of an amino acid. And what is the C terminus of an amino acid's pKa roughly? Around two, good. What about a, an average carboxylic acid who's not in an amino acid? It's closer to closer to five. 
So for instance, acetic acid has a pKa of 4.8. So if we think about an amino acid, why is the amino acid pKa so much more acidic? What uh, property we talked about today could explain that? More stable leaving group? Induction. Yeah, so the, there's not really a leaving group or like when we talk about acidity, it's more like deprotonation, right? So if we compare these two carboxylic acids, well, the carboxyl of an amino acid is kind of at a better advantage, right? Because it has this amino, which has a highly electronegative nitrogen, which can help inductively withdraw some electron density, making its pKa drastically lower. Does that make sense? And then phenols. And we know the pKa of a phenol. Would be 10. This is a value to memorize as well. Oh, you know what? I was supposed to do N terminus before that. What's the N-terminus pKa in amino acid, roughly? 9, 9.5. And then alcohols. Maybe you know the pKa of an alcohol. Could be around 15. And then the uh, last pK that you definitely need to know would be for an alpha hydrogen. So remember, we have a carbonyl. We count the carbons away from the carbonyl by a Greek letters, so alpha, beta, the alpha hydrogen of a carbonyl. And we'll talk about this more when we do enolates and tautomerisms in um, lecture three. It's gonna be around 20. Uh, we need to have, yep, you gotta, know, you gotta know all these by heart, yep. All right, so there's your table of common pKa's of OCHEM functional groups. Any questions here? Yeah, Charlie. So, what is more acidic and what's more basic here based on this pKa? Right, right. So, with decreasing pKa, are we getting more or less acidic? Decreasing pKa is more acidic. Good. Perfect. Any other questions? Okay, on to isomerism. <laughs> okay, so what defines isomers? What are isomers? Two mirror images. So that's a specific one in antimers, right? Non superimposable mirror images. In general, isomers are two different molecules which have the same what? Same, uh, same molecular formula. Perfect. So isomers are two 
molecules with the same molecular formula. So we'll start with constitutional. also known as structural. Constitutional structural isomers. Question. Which of the following is not a structural isomer of the other which of the following is not a constitutional structural isomer of the other three C, are we sure? Hey, excuse me. D, yeah. So if we count the number of carbons, you got one, two, three carbons. Count the number of hydrogens, you got three, four, five, six, seven, eight hydrogens. And same here, right? You just move the OH to a different position. But if we look here at our ether, we have one, two, three carbons, right? The three, six, seven, eight hydrogens. So C is actually a constitutional isomer of the other three, whereas D, we have one, two, three, four carbons. So that was tricky because obviously I changed the functional group that we were focusing on. And we saw that um, it was actually the tertiary alcohol, which was not the constitutional isomer. Any questions on that one? All right, so let's do Newman projections. Which are conformational isomers. So here we have a Newman projection for butane. We have carbon one, two. And the way these work, carbon three is actually behind this circle. The circle represents the bond. And then carbon four. So we have butane and then there's some cat nonsense going on over there, <laughs> if you can hear that. And so we have two types of conformations with Newman projections. We have staggered and eclipsed. Would this be staggered or eclipsed? So uh, as we'll see, like thinking about like, like a solar or like eclipse, right? When we have like, um, the sun is fully blocked. Um, eclipsed will be when the substituents are directly over each other. So because we're like, we're, we're staggered by a 60 degree angle between each of these, we would call this a staggered confirmation. This is staggered confirmation. And in a staggered confirmation, if you have two groups that are larger than hydrogen and they are at a 60 degree angle. What is the name for that interaction? A little bit of a steric interaction here.
Starts with a G. Gauche. So these two methyls are gauche. And so what that means is they are, they're slightly getting up in each other's business. They may not look that close right now, but this is an exaggerated version. And so there's a little bit of strain between these methyls here. And let's say that we were to rotate the carbon in front by 60 degrees clockwise. This be eclipsed or staggered? Now we have eclipse. So this is what eclipse is going to look like. Which of these would be having a higher free energy? We should have a higher free energy. Are staggered or are eclipsed? Yeah, our eclipsed is going to have the higher free energy. And in fact, this is not only higher free energy because it's eclipsed, it's also the worst eclipsed confirmation because the two methyls are directly on top of each other. So this is in fact the highest free energy Newman projection of butane. And then if we were to rotate further by 180 degrees, we would then get, now our methyl is 180 degrees over here. This guy's still here. Now we're back to staggered. And what's special about this particular staggered confirmation? How can we evaluate its free energy? So our two largest groups, methyls, are as far away as possible. So you see the higher, lower, lowest free energy? The lowest free energy. Any questions on Newman projections? We have our cat cameo. The sun says hi. Don't worry, buddy, I'll be done soon. But you're gonna have to hang tight. Okay, good on uh, Newman projections. Okay, so then let's cover chairs. We'll do chairs and then we will leave off with identifying chiral centers and calculating the number of stereoisomers given the number of chiral centers. Okay, so let's say we had a two dimensional version of a cyclohexane. We got our bromine here, we have a isopropyl here, and we have a chlorine here. So fortunately on the MCAT, you're not gonna have to draw a chair confirmation most likely, but if you ever did have to, the best way is to start off with two parallel lines that are diagonal and then connect them going up and down. And then we can arbitrarily number our carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm not trying to do a UPAC here. And then what we do have to keep consistent is since we counted clockwise with our cyclohexane carbons, we do have to count clockwise on the chair. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. 
And then the way it works with our hydrogens, oh, sorry, not our hydrogens, but all of our substituents, is if the two, um, the two carbons or the two substituents are pointing up, then up for the substituent will be axial. So axial will be vertical and equatorial will be outwards at an angle. So then we could do the same for carbon two here and carbon six. And then if the two substituents are pointing down, then downwards will be axial. So if you just follow the way they're pointing, you get down axial. Then for equatorial is always the opposite, opposite direction of the way the carbons are pointing. And if it's on the left side of the molecule, equatorial will be to the left. And so on carbon three, we have equatorial left and carbon five, we have up equatorial left. Okay. So are we following any, you think I can clarify any questions so far? All right. And then on the right side, equatorial down to the right, equatorial up to the right, equatorial down and to the right. So now that we've placed all of our potential substituent groups, most of which are gonna end up being hydrogens, we can go down to carbon one and bromine is on a dash. Remember, dashes will be down. So bromine is gonna be down on a dash on carbon one. And therefore, it must be axial. Okay, so that's how we're going to do it. What about isopropyl? Is it going to be equatorial on carbon three or axial? Will isopropyl be equatorial or axial on carbon three? Equatorial, right. So because isopropyl is up on a wedge and because carbon three's up is equatorial, we can put isopropyl right here. Actually, I'm gonna leave it as it's a little less, it's kind of crowded with lines here. So I'm gonna leave it as IPR. And then on carbon four, chlorine, is it gonna be axial or equatorial? Chlorine's going down on carbon four, so it has to be equatorial. And so this is one chair conformer of the molecule shown. And we can draw the other chair conformer by starting, drawing our two diagonal lines down and connecting them the opposite way. Can we clarify dashes are down? Yep. Mm -hmm. So our dash bromine is down on carbon one. And for carbon one, down is axial. Our wedge isopropyl is up on carbon three. And for carbon three, up is equatorial. Our chlorine and carbon four is dash down. And down for carbon four is equatorial. Does that help? Mm -hmm. So as we'll see when we draw the other chair conformer, our down and up will stay the same, but as we'll see, our equatorial and axial will change. So for simplicity, the easiest way is to keep your numbering the same on the out outermost carbons. So our outermost carbon on the right was one, our outermost carbon on the left was four, so I'm keeping one and I'm keeping four. And then carbon one as a bromine. Bromine is supposed to go down, but now down is equatorial. 
carbon three as an isopropyl. Two, three. Isopropyl is up on carbon three. So then on carbon three on this chair is now axial. There's our big isopropyl. And then on carbon four, we had a chlorine, which was down. It was equatorial before, but now chlorine is down axial. So that's how these are gonna work when you do a chair flip. Up and down will remain the same, but axial and equatorial will switch. Does anybody remember when it comes to stability, is it better to have your bulky large groups in equatorial or axial positions for stability? Equatorial, right? So we want the most biggest of our substituent groups in the most stable chair to be equatorial. So which is the better chair compromise in terms of stability, A or B? A is excellent. So in A, we had isopropyl and chlorine. We had two equatorial. We had bromine, one axial. In B, we had chlorine and isopropyl, two axial, sad face, and then one equatorial. So A is gonna be our more stable chair conformer. Any questions on chair conformers? Can you go over again when to draw, how to draw axial versus equatorial? Yeah. So, um, so you start with a given chair conformer, and when it comes to the way that sort of the lines are pointing. So for instance, carbon four's lines are pointing down here. And so if we just follow them, we get axial. Or carbon six here, the lines are pointing up. So if we just follow them directly up, we get axial. And so axial will follow in a vertical direction. However, the carbons are pointing that make up that vertex. Does that make sense for axial? Mm -hmm. For equatorial, uh, it's a little easier for equatorial if you've already drawn your axials in. Equatorial is going to point in the opposite direction. So on carbon four, for instance, the lines are pointing up. So equatorial would be down. And if you draw like a dash line, like I did in the middle here, um, equatorial positions on the left side of the molecule would be equatorial to the left and equatorial positions on the right side of the molecule will be equatorial to the right. So for instance, with carbon one, its vertex is pointing down, it's equatorial, therefore must be up and to the right. Does that make sense for equatorial? Awesome, yeah, my pleasure. Anything else on chairs before we move on to our last topic of the day, which is identifying chiral centers. All right, so now let's talk about stereoisomers. We're not gonna get through all the stereoisomers today just because of timing. What is the difference between a stereoisomer versus a just isomers in general? Mm -hmm. They must have a stereocenter. Mm -hmm. um, in order to be stereoisomers, you must have stereocenters. And what we could define stereoisomers as are molecules that, like all isomers, have the same formula. But they also must have the same connectivity. So unlike constitutional isomers, stereoisomers also have the same connectivity. In other words, all the atoms that are bonded in one stereoisomer are bonded to the same atoms in the other stereoisomer. What's different?
the direction, right? The orientation of the substituents. Different orientation of substituents. And as a result, different optical activity. So a stereocenter, how do we define a stereocenter? A carbon that has what? Four different substitution groups. Carbon of four different substituent groups. Now it is true, um, you could have potentially like a nitrogen that has four different substituent groups, which would technically be also a chiral center. For the purpose of the MCAT, serious centers will be limited to carbons. So with this, be a stereo center, yes or no? Would this be a stereo center? Or am I being tricky? There are four different, I think. Ethel? So I was being tricky, sorry. No. Um, what about, <laughs> got you. It's a little late for April Fools. Would this be a stereo center? Yep. We got a hydrogen, we got a methyl, we got an ethyl, and we got an isopropyl. So, any questions on identifying stereo centers? We will also have a formula for given the number of stereocenters in a molecule. Being N, what's the formula for identifying the number of stereoisomers? Two to the N. Perfect. So for example, how many stereocenters are in this molecule? Stereocenters in this molecule. You sure? Is this a stereo center? Yeah. Is this a stereo center? Yeah, I did it again. <laughs> no, yeah, not a stereo center on the right. So we have one star two stars and not. So n is equal to two here. So this would have four stereoisomers. All right, a couple more examples on that. So this will be good for identifying stereocenters and using this formula. Same question, question is number of possible Stereo isomers.
and give you answer choices. So how many stereo centers do we have here? Is this a stereo center? How about this? Good, there are three. So is this a stereo center or do stereo centers need to have dashes and wedges? Yes or no? Stereo center or no? Oh, sorry, let me, that was a confusing way to ask the question. Um, do, stereo, do stereo centers need to have uh, dashes and wedges? They do not. They just need to have four different substituent groups. So we have cyclopentyl, cyclohexyl, we have a hydrogen, and we have the rest of the molecule on the left here. So this is the third stereocenter. And so how many stereoisomers would we have? A, B, C, D. Perfect. We would have eight stereoisomers because we would have n equals three, two to the three equals eight. Any questions on that? The so same question. Sorry, my camera's glitching out there for a sec. So, um, did anybody identify how many stereo centers we have here? It's a little tricky with the ring system. Would this be a stereo center? It would, right? So we have a methyl, we have a hydrogen, we have a tertiary carbon, and we have a secondary carbon. Would this be a stereo center? Yep. So we have a hydrogen, we have a carbon who's closest to the methyl. We have a carbon who's far away from the methyl and the bromine. We have a carbon who's closer to the bromine. Would this be a stereocenter? No. Nope, it's got two hydrogens. What about this uh, right here? Yes. Yep. So the trick with polycyclic ring systems 
is unless the entire thing is completely symmetrical, all the connections between multiple rings will be stereo centers. So that'll make this a stereo center, this a stereo center, and then would this be one? Yep, and that'll be our final stereo center for a total of one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have two to the six, which is two to the three times two to the three, nice. Which is eight times eight, 64. Best answer C. Excellent. Any questions on these problems here or identifying stereo centers? All right, so that's where we're gonna leave it off for today. And for next week, we're gonna kick off things with the Kahn Ingold prelog rules of absolute configuration. So in other words, R and S. And then we'll move on from R and S to uh, talking about what it means to be a chiral molecule. And then we'll talk about diastereomers and antiomers, epimers, meso compounds. And, and then we'll talk about like plus and minus D and L E and Z, cis and trans. So any other questions while we're still recording for the people on YouTube to hear? Okay, I'm signing off now. And everybody on YouTube, thank you for watching. Feel free to like the video and subscribe. And that'll only help increase the visibility of these.